exciting. I hope if there is a storm that we uh, are covered and sheltered while it happens and that we are able to emerge afterwards. There's some allegory there that I was not able to put my finger on. Um, but hi, my name is Chrissy and I've had the opportunity to say hi to most of you in the room. I know I missed a couple of people, I apologize for that. Welcome. I also have had the opportunity to, in meeting you, see that there are quite a lot of you guys who are here for your first time. And so I'm very, very excited for that because one of our challenges is always making, finding a way to communicate with our community. And we know that you're super, super busy. And we know that it's uh, an imposition to ask you to take time out on a Thursday night or Monday morning or whatever. But it's our privilege to be able to be here and to communicate with you. This is, I believe, our 78th town hall um, in the last, I got it right, all right. Um, the last five years. Let's go ahead and move on. Importantly, the civics uh, town hall, this is the topic of today. For those who are new, we do a different thing with town halls. We focus deep on one area, and we make sure that we talk about that one area, have questions about that one area, have experts about that one area, I think that this is an important part of what our community is. We're a purple community, very equally divided, R, D, and I. We're a pragmatic community. We want to see our government work. And we are a fact-seeking community, too. We want to understand what's going on in our community, in our commonwealth, and in our country. So this is the agenda that we're going to be going through. Usually in these town halls, and today is not an exception, we will be giving a legislative update. About three out of every four weeks, I'm down in Washington, D.C. on our behalf. About one out of every four weeks, I'm able to be here in our community. So I'll be giving you a little bit of an update there. Then we are privileged to be joined by Eric Denyer, who's going to be talking about We the People and the We the People Hub. And what this is, is a part of our, um, our, our, our topic today, our topic being the Civics Town Hall. Uh, and I think that you'll find this to be interesting. Any of you who are in the audience who are educators or who are lifelong learners will be interested in this particular product and this particular person. Um, we will then transition into questions and answers, moderated by our very own Mary Curley, who's our communications director here at the CCIU. The other thing that we do in our town halls is we move them around as much as we are able to around our community. This district is all of Chester County and the lower part of Berks. In fact, we just got out of the car from Reading and from the Berks uh, Community College as well. Um, and so we try to make sure that when we're having these town halls, we're burying the places that they are and we're burying the times of day. And we're also burying the medium. So sometimes we'll do telephone town halls as an example as well. Um, after that, we'll be able to, to talk a little bit uh, about your questions and, and give you hopefully some answers as well. And then Mary will introduce Laura Hall from the Bipartisan Policy Center for an interesting uh, development that has happened. And I appreciate you being here today. Next slide, please. Another thing for those of you guys who are new here that we try to do is this world is a really um, difficult world to exist in right now. We spend a lot of time um, yelling at each other. We spend a lot of time misunderstanding one another. Is everything okay? Yeah, we spend a lot of time misunderstanding one another. And I really want to be helpful in trying to find a way to bring us back together, to bring us back in conversation and to heal us. I think this comes a little bit from our Quaker heritage here in Pennsylvania. I think it comes a lot from the fact that I had the opportunity to be an educator in a classroom for a while. And learning about this concept of classroom norms was something that was revolutionary to me. We know when we're in, in a building and we're in a meeting that we don't have to behave with one another. We know that we're in a classroom. We, we learn how to behave with one another. And so taking a page from that, these are some of the norms that I would ask for us to absorb and adhere to treating one another with respect, using our time wisely, making sure that we're talking about issues and not personalities. I think that's really very important. Uh, asking what's called clarifying questions, if that's you know necessary, clarifying question, not being an accusatory question, but rather just sort of an inquis inquisitive question. And also really importantly, that we will discuss here the policy and not the politics of the issue. So I will do my very, very best to present the most apartheid bipartisan conversation that I can while we're here today, and I hope that we are all able to do that. Next slide. So in preparation for that, another innovation in our town halls is to ask you all if you have questions to write them down on your cards. And the reason we ask you to do that is historically, many people have the same question. 
And we want to make sure that we don't ask and answer the same question seven or eight times and not get to other questions that we don't have time for. We also want to make sure that we're able to follow up and follow through with you. So to that end, please make sure that you put your name on this card, your contact information. Please uh, follow something that I'm not capable of following, which is write legibly, um, because that way we can actually read your question or read your contact information. And please hand your card to any one of the many, many members of my team here who are here right now, who please will raise your hand if you're out and about and uh, they will collect your card. Then they will be collected and they will be sorted by our, uh, our unbiased, nonpartisan moderator uh, to make sure that we have the opportunity to answer all your questions. So I think I'm a little bit ahead of schedule right now. Scott Spitt decided to talk a blue streak about what's going on in Washington. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So in each of our town halls, we also try to give a legislative update. This, this is probably or hopefully in, in anticipation of you wondering what the heck is going on in Washington. Um, straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Um, and, th and that way we hopefully are also answering some of your questions about um, what would appear sometimes from the outside and always from the inside to be quite a lot of madness down in Washington, D.C. So um, importantly, I'll be returning to Washington on Monday next week. We will have 13 weeks at that point in time, I'm sorry, 13 working days at that point in time by our calendar, by our deadline to pass the annual budget. I'm going to tell you right now that that will not happen. And it's okay, we will find a way through this, but it's going to be a slog and it's going to be kind of a lot of drama. And please know that I'm down there working to make sure that, that uh, we get through this as rapidly as we can and that we have a responsible budget, defensible budget. I was actually sworn in five years ago to the nation's longest budget shutdown, if you might remember. Uh, it ended up with a lot of people um, not have, receiving paychecks, a lot of government programs being stopped, and I don't want to see that happening again. Um, I will tell you that I did hold yesterday, just yesterday, a telephone town hall with Chief Economist Mark Zandi, who actually happens to be from here, from Westchester, and he's the head of Moody's Analytics and the head um, economist for Moody's. And if you want to uh, listen to and get good answers to good questions about what's going on in our economy, what's going on in inflation, what's going on with the budget, I would encourage you to listen to that hour-long town hall because there were a lot of really, really rich questions there. But basically what the, what the hang-up is right now in Washington is that we have what's uh, called appropriations bills, 12 different bills um, that both the House and the Senate have to pass to be able to then pass them into the budget, uh, being housed by, passed by the House and by the Senate. Unfortunately, there are a very, very small group of people uh, who are blocking that vote from happening and blocking the, us from being able to pass those bills from the committees that they're in to the floor and onwards to a reconciliation with the Senate and onwards to the President's desk for signature. The hang up is an argument about funding through the border. Um, I will tell you that uh, the President's budget and the budget stop that have been allocated on the Senate side have four billion dollars more money for the border, new money for the border, but the argument uh, from those just a handful of people, roughly I think uh, 12 or 14 people, is that it's not enough. Um, and so this is going to be the argument. What, where I stand on this is I think it's very, very important that we recognize there are 435 of us in Congress, not just 12 of us, and we need to make sure that we're advocating for all of our needs and being responsible, fiscally responsible about that. But that's fundamentally the core of what the argument is here. Uh, so please pay attention to that. I am going to be one of those people who's going to be doing my best to be pragmatic, but I think that this kind of brinksmanship is super irresponsible, and I hope that we don't end up in a place that it, it's possible that we may end up in. Uh, potential shutdown, uh, we've talked about that. If the shutdown happens, or, or a threat of a shutdown happens, one of the things that could happen is what's called a continuing resolution, or a CR. What the CR is is what it sort of sounds like. It's uh, the agreement that we will all just continue, and we will continue under the rules of before. Uh, what that effectively means is that we're continuing with last year's budget or the year that we're in's budget. And of course, that uh, is not necessarily great news for people who uh, run defense programs, as an example. People who are working in schools and want to make sure that they're able to uh, pay for the new ideas. Ukraine is another great example. We don't necessarily want to move forward on the budget that we have in the past. We want to move forward on a budget that reflects our, our current priorities and our current values. Uh, to that end, I want to just remind those of you who are new here, uh, those of you who are old and some of you who are new here, that um, I am 
a Democrat, but I also am a fiscally responsible person. I very much believe that we need to make sure that we're being responsible with our nation and our, on our taxpayer dollars. And to that end, I'm part of something called the New Dem or New Democratic Coalition. It's a group of about 101 Democrats. We caucus or meet over the importance of fiscal responsibility and the importance of uh, jobs and opportunity and the value and strength of capitalism. And I want to rewind to that statement again. 101 of us caucus on this issue. It's one of the largest, if not the largest, ideological caucuses in the Congress that you probably have never heard about. Uh, and that's something that's really important for all of us to know when we watch the news in, in horror, which I do as well. Next slide, please. So now turning away from sort of what's going on in the, in the top lines, the headlines, we will be um, distracted by that for the better part of it, certainly this month, if not the next several months. What we're here to talk about is the other stuff that's going on in Washington, specifically that has to do um, with the way our government works and making sure that we are responsible uh, citizens and, uh, and civically engaged. Here is a piece of legislation that's an example of that, that has passed the 116th Congress, which was four years ago, the 117th Congress, which was two years ago, and is now in, in, in the hopper, so to speak, in this Congress. I do not necessarily believe that this will necessarily get a vote, and we can talk about that later, but this is something that has to do with our civic responsibilities to one another and our engagement with one another. So the Freedom to Vote Act has these kinds of things in it, um, that voter registration and same-day registration, voting by mail, um, combative voter intimidation and voter suppression, and this goes both ways, guys. This goes both sides of the aisle, any place that you go, this isn't a partisan issue, this is just a people issue. We have this unique special way of intimidating each other when it comes to the polls. Um, fixing part of partisan gerrymandering, that's also something that happens on both sides of the aisle. Every place that you go, there has been um, a process sometimes of jiggering our, um, our voting districts into places that are convenient for the party or the person in charge rather than the people. And so this piece of legislation works on that. Digital ad transparency. Most of you all, if not all, are on some form of media, whether social media or traditional media. It's important that you know who's paying for the things you're reading. And digital ad, ad transparency is part of that. Forced disclosure of dark money. Some people call this uh, PAC money, gray money, dark money. Uh, we want to make sure that you know where money is coming from, who's giving to these PACs, so that you can understand who's driving the money in the machine uh, that is politics. And of course, the last thing, importantly, most of us are small dollar donors. We want to make sure that the small dollar donors have power. It's very important. But we also want to make sure that we're empowering campaigns to be competitive with one another, so that not just the most wealthy of us are able to run for Congress, or the most connected of us are able to run for or any office, but rather that all of us have the opportunity to express ourselves and run. So that's kind of what's going on uh, as one example of civics engagement. I'm just checking for my time to make sure I'm not running late. Uh, I am running late. Uh, and so I will conclude by saying here are also some examples of civic engagements. I'm enormously proud uh, of our office. Our office is very, very small. We are 18 people total. We are about nine down in D.C. and about nine here in our community. We have been blessed and honored with several different awards uh, that have acknowledged the hard work that we do here. The first award as a freshman office for accountability and accessibility uh, was given to this office. The second award uh, was given to us for constituent services just last year. And coupled with that, a third award for best places to work. Um, this is, I think, a really good contrast of not only are we hopefully doing a good job for you all, the customer, but we are also hopefully being a good place to work as well. So this is the only office that has been recognized three times by the Congressional Management Foundation, and no other office has won two awards in one year, so I'm enormously proud of that. partisan to this conversation from an organization that is nonpartisan and nonprofit. 
uh, tax exempt and an educational 501c3. The mission of this his organization is to educate the public on the history and the heritage of the U.S. and the U.S. capital, its institutions, and the people who have served in them. So it's my pleasure to introduce Eric now for his presentation.
So we had about 50 different procedures. So two rules, 50 different procedures. Um, and the reason we have these procedures is everyone knows their part, everyone knows their responsibility and what they're supposed to do in the classroom. But then it's like we get out to society sometimes and it falls apart, right? We get to, you know, we get to our quarters and we argue and fight with each other and we forget that we are here together, right? We need to figure out procedures, we need to figure out laws that work for all of us. And we know that compromise is not a bad word, right? So now I'm going to talk a little bit about compromise and I'm going to talk about civics and history being relevant to your life, right? It's really hard to teach a group of eighth graders about the Declaration of Independence when it was written in 1776. And like, what are we talking about? The old person, you know, the people for it's old person document. But if I present it, hey, Declaration of Independence was a breakup letter and a birth certificate. All right, then they're in, then they're in, because they can relate to that, absolutely. Um, so I'll tell you what, Bobby, let's go to the next slide. All right, so a couple of resources you'll find here. And one thing that I was brought in to do on the slide was the step by step lesson plan for first year teachers. I think one of the reasons that we lose great teachers is we ask them to do so much, they have to worry about behavior management materials. They have to worry about writing IEPs and visual education plans. Um, they might not be a content expert. They might, they might love history, they might love social studies, but they may not be a content expert on the constitutional or on the or what right? So we put in lesson plans, step-by-step -step lesson plans for first year teachers to hopefully retain them while they get their footing. Uh, we have obviously resources about the interventions government, and then a big one we partnered with Storywood Works, which is a theater production company down in Mississippi, on uh, teaching the Constitution for theater. We have a great reconstruction era play called Out of the Time uh, that I'll go ahead and show you that. So let's go ahead and do this. Aubrey, let's go back. Can you guys not hear me? Can you guys hear me now? Oh, yes. Okay. Sorry about that. All right, now you haven't heard anything I've said. Let's go ahead and go, go through the hub. So Aubrey, if you can go back to that first slide there, we'll take everyone through the hub. All right, Aubrey, so go ahead and click on that link if you guys use the uh, QR code and show your phones as well. Can't go far. 
<laughs> there is a great, there is, there is a little snippet of the hour and a half play. So it's a 10 minute play, and then you have an actual lesson plan that goes with those 10 minutes in the play. Because as with adults and with children, we don't have a certain amount of attention span, right? An hour and a half play is not going to be good for eighth graders or adults. So we have a 10 minute uh, part of the play, and then there's a lesson plan. This one is specifically talking about reconstruction and restoration. Okay, we have all kinds of lesson plans in here. Um, if you would like, I can stay after we're getting close on time. Chris, I want to see down our conversation. I just want to show you guys the hub a little bit there, including I'm happy to stay afterwards and talk to you guys a little bit more about the hub kind of access it. Sorry, we had a little trouble. Uh, you guys had a little trouble here. Um, but Chris, if you are ready, I'm ready to have our conversation about civics. So thank you so much, guys, for listening. All right, I really appreciate it. And, uh, Thank you. It's blowing a gale out there. Um, I think that we're going to be sitting down for this conversation. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So should we sit down there? Does that work? Okay. And the screen is going to go up. Excellent. That works. Um, and I have the opportunity now to once again um, introduce Mary Curley, who's going to be our moderator today for your questions. And to remind you, if you haven't turned your questions in, to raise your hand up, and one of our team will come and get them. And she will be, Mary will be uh, working through those questions between Eric and I. Uh, and we'll do our best to answer your questions as well. A reminder that Mary is the Communications Director here in the Chester County Intermediate Unit, making the lighting as well. So I will go ahead and sit down and introduce you guys. I sneak up on people all the time. Turn your mics on to stop the button when you're when you want to speak. Uh, I think with the two of us or the two seated, we were told you could leave your mics on. Uh, but if you do, be aware that your mics are on. It's a hot night. Can you hear me? All right, we're rolling. All right. So the first question we have, uh, and I believe that this is a question that you both could, could answer. If we can, if we cannot agree on what should be taught in a civics course, what is the way forward to move as a nation? For instance, in a list of issues that matter most to you, we can't agree on what government reform means. Sure, I, I will give a, a try at that. And I agree with you that we are at a, a very difficult time politically and nationally in terms of what our curriculum should be in these areas. Can you all hear me okay? Um, I actually think that one of the bigger struggles, at least something that I'm working on, with Representative Don Bacon, who's a Republican from Nebraska, also happens to be a four-star general, but wants to a three-star general, I believe, um, is that we don't actually have civics classes at all. So forget about, you know, what is the curriculum, we really have sort of abandoned that as a concept uh, in general, nationally, and we, he and I, uh, are some of the founders of something called Fort Country. And Fort Country is a group of people in Washington, all members of Congress, all who have served in uniform. And none of us agree on much in terms of our political ideology. But we all agree on the importance of pragmatism and coming together and finding singles and doubles and hopefully no runs. One of the areas that we, he and I, are working on is civics and civics engagement and um, uh, national service. Because I think national service isn't just wearing a military uniform, it's also being an educator or being an EMT or a postal worker. So I agree that we are in a difficult place right now and we are struggling to figure out what we teach. But I first off think that we ought to, from a federal perspective, agree that we should teach civics and then that will help us be able to.
that in my stuff in the classrooms all the time. Uh, I will also say that just it may be irrelevant to their lives in engaging these kids because a recent uh, in a report came out of the nation of 13%, just 13% of our nation's eighth graders um, were proficient in US history and just 22% were proficient in civics, what we're talking about tonight. Now that is that is a bit of there's no doubt, there's no way to sure code that, but it's also an opportunity. Um, and I'm truly passionate um, about jumping at this opportunity, using resources like our people um, to get lesson plans out to teachers throughout the nation. Um, so Can you, there was a, a kind of subtle question from the audience to define um, civics in terms of sort of what are we talking about when we talk about that? I think we probably can find the dictionary definition. Sure. But, but for me, it is what you're speaking of, which is how does our government work? What is our role in the government? Um, and what, how, does that, how is that reflected in the history of this nation? Absolutely. And you know, how, do our, how does our government work? How do our institutions within that government function? And I saw my students too, like, remember, those of you who go into the National Archives, you go into the website of the National Archives, those aren't magic words on those parchments and on the on
teachers have to have rapport. All right, there's no, you know, as much as I would love, there's no magic law we're going to pass that's just going to make this all better. It happens at the local level with teachers invested in their students, building rapport with their students. That's when true learning and education happens. And I got news for you guys. When you're a first year teacher and you first get in the classroom, it doesn't happen like that, right? It takes a long time to build up, and that's why we need to like the hub. All right, we're hoping, we're hoping, we're hoping to help out teachers just that much so they can get their feet wet, their behavior can be continued. So they get their feet wet talking to parents, writing on your and all that stuff. They not necessarily have to be content experts, and then they can help you, or they can build rapport with their students. And then once they build that rapport, once they get, um, you know, their group, once they get their group, the sky's the limit. And I've seen this, especially teachers from about here, about three or four, just, I mean, they're just phenomenal, phenomenal educators. But make it relevant, engage with the students. I remember I used to have my students uh, draw political cartoons. They loved it then in seventh and eighth grade. So you've got to find ways to connect with, uh, with your students and build them. And the uh, last thing I will say on this subject is I'm really, really passionate about teachers and the undervalued um, reality that we just don't, we don't value teachers enough. We don't pay them enough, we don't respect them enough, um, we second guess them all the time. They are um, allies of ours in the classroom. And so uh, the latitude and the ability to allow them to be your your expert on, on educating your child, you should be involved as a parent, of course. Parental engagement is essential, but you also need to not kind of, as a collective, we need to not constantly be second guessing and undermining the, the ability that they have to teach our children. Uh, we have several questions uh, regarding civics in the classroom and, and reinstating it. So I'm going to try to combine them um, into a, a couple parts. So um, as, as most of us are aware, uh, school is, is usually under local control, and, and you were referenced that, uh, Eric. So how do we as citizens uh, reinstate civics in the classroom um, do we meet with school boards? Are there other suggestions? So that's the, the first part. And then the, the second part is what, um, if anything, can be done on the federal level to encourage on the, the state and local level uh, a reintroduction and emphasis on civics? So I'm kind of reading several questions here. It's a great question. And a lot of the authorities in this rest with the local school, local school boards and making sure that your local school boards are engaged and involved and know your preferences and your priorities is very important. Um, as well the state, um, to be really honest, the federal government has a lot less to do with education than people seem to think that it does. Um, we are, uh, as an example, only about 10 cents of every dollar in terms of what goes to schools, um, and, and that's the reality. Um, and so our authorities are also equivalently less strong than local authorities are too. We can do things like recommending, you know, that, and incentivizing and granting resources to school, I mean, to states to allow these kinds of things to happen. But we can't make a whole lot of things happen that don't that local areas want to happen. Um, and that you can see in all kinds of legislative uh, efforts, such as healthcare, um, or such as COVID, you know, response to COVID. Uh, a lot of what we do in Washington is a sense of Congress. It's an attempt to tell people that this is what Congress would like us to do, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it happens in that way. Here's what I'll say too. I mean, I'll be, I'll be blunt. Like, if you have a problem with the education system in this country, go do something about it. Go, go be a teacher. Um, go see what they go. I mean, I worked in an alternative certification program. I was a political science major down here in Florida. Didn't think I wanted anything to do with students at all. Um, then I took a job down uh, around Orlando and I worked with kids with life threatening illnesses. Absolutely loved it. With my history background, as well as my science background, I went and became a teacher. And through this alternative certification program, I mean, like Chris was saying, I, 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 it, I just didn't know how undervalued these teachers were. And it's, it truly is a crisis in this country because there were so many good people in the profession. So just support your teachers. Go be a teacher yourself. Go see what it's like because um, it's easy to criticize. Um, but it's much more beneficial to you and for our communities uh, to actually go and make a difference in your country. Thank you. Uh, switching tact uh, uh, just a little bit, uh, several questions regarding the, the breakdown of norms, um, uh, both perceived uh, in, from, from the public 
to uh, our, our representatives in uh, Washington. Um, and then uh, also uh, from what people expect and, and how can a robust civics education kind of reinstill um, in people uh, that faith in the institutions. And there, there's mentions of the January 6th um, um, insurrection, uh, the declining uh, faith in the Supreme Court by the American public, and uh, just general overall um, uh, norms not being followed or perceived not to be followed. So I worry too, um, which is why I'm here, and this is why I ran for office having not done that before. I want to be a part of the solution. I want to be of service. I think we all can be part of that solution. I'm enormously disheartened by the erosion of norms, but they are norms. They're not laws. They're not rules. We can't we can't lawify everything. Um, and so I think that one of the ways that we can respond is is this way. Look, look at us. We're here. You know. We're participating, we're listening. My guess is some of you don't agree with things I'm saying. My guess is I don't agree with some of the things you're thinking. That's okay. Um, but we're being civil with one another, we're participating with one another. Um, I think it's my responsibility to behave as an example. Um, I think it's the responsibility of all elected officials to behave as a good example, um, and all servant leaders to behave as a good example. I think it's our responsibility as citizens to do what we know is the right thing to do. You know, these are general things that we learn in kindergarten. Um, and I think that we um, are losing our grip in terms of how we behave to one another. I visited a center today that deals with people who are, are primarily Spanish language speakers and need help. And uh, the head of that center was just showing me this new environment, and part of this new environment was a quiet room, a quiet room for the people who work there to be able to go to, to reset themselves after having been yelled at by people who were there seeking help. This is not uncommon. Classroom side, one of my friends growing up against a locker by one of her class, by her teachers, I mean her students. Um, all of us, I worry every time I step into this room, you know, what's gonna happen? We have policemen here because we worry for our own safety. But we can change this, you know, we can work on this. And that's one of the things I tell people down in Washington about our community, is we're different. We are working hard to talk to each other. And we need to you know, model that across um, broader areas than just our community, across all of Pennsylvania and across the country. And I have hope, that's kind of why we're here. Um, so I guess I don't have very good answers other than we also need to know that we're responsible for some of that being fed. If we click on things, if we read things, if we forward things, if we talk about the, the bad behavior of the people who we all know what I'm talking about, then that only encourages that behavior. If we all click on that, that link and y'all give that person a dollar, then that encourages that behavior. And then they do that nonsense if in Washington is an example because they know that they're gonna be able to you know, raise a million dollars on those five minutes worth of nonsense um, at one dollar at a time. So don't don't let them encourage you. Find the good things to forward to one another and good things to talk to about one another. And our nation's children are watching and they're paying attention what adults in public life and just adults in general do. So it's refreshing to hear you talk like that, Chrissy, it really is. Um, because you don't, as Chrissy said, you're not gonna agree with everyone and everything policy like, and that is absolutely fine. But there's no reason that every single person, you know, whether it be a student, whether it be someone who's 90 years old, cannot treat everyone uh, with civility and with respect. And we are losing that. And I, I see it all the time, you know, students are like, well, this person does it, this adult in my life does it, so you know, I'm gonna do it. And you know, there's a certain part of that where I'm like, yeah, I mean, I see where the kid's coming from, I do. And so it is on the adults, right? And there's an onus on public, you know, elected officials as well to comport themselves in a manner that we wanna see reflected uh, in the rest of our, our society. So just remember, children are watching too, they're taking our, their cues from us. Um, switching gears just slightly, but, um, probably um, not uh, arguably, uh, one of the greatest civic duties is voting. So we have a uh, judge of elections here today and uh, who says that except for the presidential election every four years, voter turnout is lacking. What can Congress and educators do to convince voters that elections matter and to vote twice a year every year? Yeah. Great question, that's super important. I had the chance to go to Australia on a trip related to national security and national defense um, three years ago. 
Australia and New Zealand. I think certainly Australia, I don't remember if New Zealand has a mandatory voting requirement. You know, you have to vote, and if you don't vote, you're fine, and they have something like 90 something percent voting turnout, and that's good. I don't think that that's something that's going to be able to happen here in this country for lots and lots of different reasons. I think we're too much, we take too much pride in our free will to, to have that be something that happens. But we really do need to understand the power of our vote. Tuesday of this week, up in Rhode Island, uh, there are two members of Congress in Rhode Island. One member, Mr. Cicilline, retired um, before his term was over, which sets up what's called a special election, which means that it happens out of sequence, not at the same time as every other election. I think there were seven or eight people, Democrats, who ran in the Democratic primary, and then I don't know how many, one or two, I believe, on the Republican side. <coughs> this is a primarily Democratic area. Of the seven or eight people who ran, one, of course, won on Tuesday. That person, I think, won with 10,000 votes. Out of a 700,000 person <coughs> population, with probably 400,000 of those people are eligible to vote, we are talking about winning in you know, in tens of thousands of votes because no one showed up to vote for that person. And that person, that, and I'm not criticizing that person because I don't even know his name, um, but what I'm saying is that person will now go to the general election and because it's a Democratic seat, will win, go away. And they will win for the rest of fraternity, you know, as long as they don't do really stupid things. And even if they do do really stupid things. Um, but that's kind of the, the point is that because of apathy, this person, who, will, who may be very, very well qualified, was selected out of seven or eight people because very few people turned out. So I think it's really, really essential that we tell people how important it is to vote. And I tell people I was raised by one R and one D, and they cancel each other's vote out every single time, and they had dinner together every yep. single time, and we lived happily ever after. And so I think it's really important, no matter who you vote for, that you vote. Yeah, and I, and I think it's important to remember too that politics, right, voting is extremely important. But there are other parts of life too. <laughs> and I comes from a political science major. And we all have to make sure that, you know, we enjoy, you know, we enjoy that family dinner, right? We enjoy, you know, people's company that we might disagree with. Um, as far as getting kids interested in voting, well, voting is you guys know is 18. So it is hard to get kids who are in seventh and eighth grade really interested in something that they can't take part in. Um, you know, you can still do mock, you know, votes in class, whether we're gonna have a pizza party or an ice cream party. And I remember uh, a lot of the people or a lot of kids uh, who chose not to vote in my class when we were doing the vote between us two, they said, uh, you know, I'm really upset that I didn't get an ice cream party. Um, I was like, you didn't vote. And like, that's that's what happens when you don't vote, right? The other side is gonna get what they want. I know that's a really simple way to explain it, but I think it's an effective way to explain it. Uh, I'm from a teacher perspective. Um, Thank you. Uh, so switching a little bit, I think we've um, covered most of the topics under uh, the civics umbrella, but uh, I, I've been uh, a lifelong educator and someone who's been in schools for 38 years now. There's a, a question from a freshman at Downingtown West High School about gun violence in our community, and it is, is top of mind. Uh, uh, this person. Uh, uh, has said that she has personally been the victim of threats of gun violence and has seen football games at her school shut down due to violent threats. And she wants to know how we can address these problems and how we plan on protecting not just our schools but our community as well. Sure, and thank you very much for the question. And I'm also really glad when younger people come to our, our town halls and I would encourage more people to bring younger people as well. Um, Gun safety, gun violence is a huge issue. I taught, as I mentioned, in 11th grade. My school was Simon Gratz in North Philly. We had um, policemen on every floor. We had um, metal detectors on every door. And we still had um, gun issues within uh, the classrooms and the schools quite regularly. And certainly a lot of my kids in their everyday lives were exposed to gun violence very, very frequently. Um, and this is not just an issue of places like Simon Gratz. It's an issue here, as mentioned. We are currently like, looking around, hoping that an escaped prisoner won't be in our presence. Um, it's everywhere. Uh, the, the, the good news is we were able to get something done in gun safety and gun violence. We were able to get it done in the last Congress, in the 117th Congress, for the very first time in 28 years, we were able to pass some gun safety legislation bipartisanly, which was good. It's not enough. 
it doesn't do nearly enough. It was a good compromise in the sense that it kind of went on the issue of uh, you know limiting access to guns for those who shouldn't have access to guns, but also making sure that we were providing opportunities for uh, securing our schools better. I struggle sometimes with that compromise because I want people to feel welcome in a school. You know, I don't want, I don't appreciate like the expression of hard in mean, a, a school that feels antithetical to what a school environment ought to be. But I do understand, just like with issues on our border, as an example, that good people can have different and great ideas of what the solution can be. And we need to be able to compromise on those solutions. There need to be fewer guns. People need to have um, the you know, requirements to have access to them if they're the right people who should have access and not people who are mentally unsound. We might need to consider ways to make sure our schools are more safe. That's okay too. The reality is, however, that this Congress, the one that's happening right now, if you want to see anything more happen on gun safety, you're going to have to change the Congress. Um, because that's, it's not going to be a priority right now at the federal level. The reality also, however, is that if you want something done about gun safety, you should look to the state level and to the local level, probably more than you should look to the federal level. The idea that 435 of us are going to come together on something like as, as charged as this is a hard one, hard um, and relatively unlikely um, given the environment that we're in right now. But I think some states, uh, in Florida, I think is an example or an idea of one. Um, Connecticut, you know, did some really serious things after after Sandy Hook. Uh, and uh, I think we have opportunities at the state level too. So don't just aim yourselves at your representatives in Washington, aim yourselves at state and local as well. And I will say from, you know, classroom, teaching a classroom perspective, it's, it's heartbreaking. Every time we have to go to lockdown, I see the impact I uh, a lot of kids on the spectrum and their anxiety is, is off the chart. Um, it's, it's heartbreaking. Um, so I'll say whoever wrote that question out there, get involved and change it. You know, if you want to change something, get involved. I and mean, that's what I'm going to be coming back to, right? We need to civically engage, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Um, I think we have three minutes left for the Q&A portion. So uh, one last question, um, both from um, Congresswoman Bullahan uh, and from Eric. Uh, one as someone who is in the House of Representatives and one who follows their actions closely. Uh, what are your realistic fears for these next few months in the House, and what are your best hopes? So my fear is that we'll be where we were when I first came into Congress and that we will shut down the government as we did when I first came into Congress, um, and, and that is my fear. Um, obviously, I hope that that's not the case. My hope is that there is actually some goodness happening in Congress bipartisanly. Uh, I work with uh, a number of mostly women. Uh, there are six of us, one gentleman, on family leave issues bipartisanly. There are three Democrats and three Republicans who have been working very constructively with one another on trying to allow that family and medical leave will be extended to more of us. Uh, we were able to uh, legislate that uh, federal employees, all federal employees, I think 2.1 million federal employees, would now be able to have 12 weeks of paid uh, leave uh, when they had a birth of a child. And we were able to make sure that people in uniform, men and women uh, of all services, would also have 12 weeks of 12 weeks. And this is in addition to if they had, uh, for instance, a C-section as well. That shouldn't count as your parental leave when you are um, recovering. Um, so that is progress that we've made, and I have hope that this group of bipartisan, mostly women, will come together on the House side of things. It's the first of its kind. It's the first group of its kind to be working on these issues. Historically, Democrats have worked on them, and Republicans have worked on it, but never the twins shall meet. Um, the other good news is that there's a group as well on the Senate side of about, I think it's, it's a more clandestine group because senators tend to be a little bit more quiet about who they, what they're working on and who they're working on it with. But I think it's between eight and 10 of, of them, also bipartisan, and we're working together to make sure that we have a, uh, a, a legislative solution that I hope within the next calendar year we might be able to put forward when we get out of the morass of funding the government. My fear is just that not only members of Congress, but just you know, us in the United States, that we, we lose our connection with one another. We lose our humanity. Um, I'm an eternal optimist. I don't think we're at the point of no return yet, but I think we see a lot of our rhetoric, um, a lot of us going to our quarters, um, you know, take away those remorses that we've been talking about. Um, and I think 
we could be any kind of dangerous path. But we we are powerful stuff and, and just turn the ship around. Um, and so what I hope for is uh, I don't bring it right back to the hub, right? Um, I'm working with Senator uh, Collins in the office of Maine. Um, she wants to make a video that we're gonna put on the hub about, about being a US Senator. Christy, I would love to work with you as well if you're off this, you know, about the legislative process and everything we'll be speaking about tonight. Um, working with um, Representative Tom Walker Dove's office out in California on voting rights and environment. Um, so there are there are great representatives, there are great you know, constituents, great people out there. I'll bring it all back to what I was saying. We need people who want to be involved in the process, civically engaged, and vote. Um, and that's that's how we're going to turn the ship around. It doesn't mean we're going to agree with everyone on everything, just like Chris said. And that's okay. That's that's part of what this country's about. But at the end of the day, you know, we were born, our government was born at a compromise of the Constitutional Convention in 1787. Um, and you know what? I think if we're going to continue that great experiment, we need to learn how to compromise once again. Thank you, Boo. Uh, that will conclude our question and answering session. It is now my pleasure to introduce Laura Hall, the Executive Director of BPC Action. Uh, Laura joined BPC in March 2011 after several years of senior level experience on Capitol Hill. And prior to joining BPC, she spent eight years on the staff of former Representative Dennis Moore. And for the last five years, Paula has served Moore as, le as Legislative Director. In that role, she developed and coordinated the legislative agenda and floor strategy for the congressman on a wide range of issues, working closely with House leadership, senior committee staff, and key caucuses. It is now my pleasure to introduce Laura Hall. that was founded by four former Senate Majority Leaders, Dole, Daschle, Baker, and Mitchell, two Republicans and two Democrats. Uh, we work with elected officials from both parties to craft viable solutions to improve Americans' lives. As you all know, and we've talked about tonight, pointless partisanship and petty bickering in D.C. gets a lot of attention. Uh, but in the course of our work at BPC, as we spent time with lawmakers in Capitol Hill on a daily basis, we experienced a different reality. There are plenty of members of Congress who are doing real work. They just aren't always the ones getting the attention. So in 2017, we established the Legislative Action Award. Um, the Legislative Action Award from the Bipartisan Policy Center is designed to spotlight and celebrate the most creative and courageous members of Congress who are working across the aisle on policy and have demonstrated exceptional skill, grace, and tenacity to get things done for their constituents in the nation. So tonight, I'd like to announce to you all that we are awarding the 2023 Legislative Action Award to Congressman Houlihan. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming from DC, I assume. 
Um, and thank you all for coming to this, this town hall. For those of you who are new, I hope you come to more. Um, there are different subjects every time. Uh, please check our website. If we had the screen down, I would be showing that to you in our um, newsletters, which are frequent and abundant and uh, well written. And um, I'm grateful to you guys for coming tonight. And thanks. Th thankfully, the rain I believe has stopped. So I'll see you around the community, and I uh, wish you luck down in DC.